Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to Stop the Music's Irvine Public Forum. We're going to get started at around 7.05 to give people a chance to enter the Zoom space. And in the meantime, you can let us know in the chat where you're streaming from and what made you interested in coming to the forum. The Zoom will also be recorded in case you have any privacy concerns something to be mindful of. And we also have Mandarin translation and closed captioning available. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there should be a translation button that you can click on. And I think we're expecting about 95-ish people today. So we'll get started in a few minutes. Cool, so it looks like we can get started now. Um, if we could go to the next slide. We'll begin first with a land acknowledgement from an indigenous land and African labor recognition statement adapted from Melina Abdullah of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and with assistance of Reverend Gregory Douglas of the Native American United Methodist Church in Anaheim and end with a brief moment of silence. Stop the Music Coalition acknowledges that this land which we inhabit in Orange County is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Achiman, Keech, and Tongva peoples. We pay respect to these and all indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. We pay homage to those who were stolen from Africa, placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel, and forced into labor, who were called slaves but never submitted to such and have always been fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine and to each other. We honor our African ancestors for the still unpaid labor which built what is now the Americas. To both our indigenous and African forebearers, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations, for it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor. Now we'll have a moment of silence. Thank you. And if we could go to the next slide. Um, again, feel free to utilize the chat to let us know where you're at and to ask any questions that might come up during the forum. Or if you have any questions for a specific panelists, you can also drop them there. And on the agenda, Next, we're going to go over community guidelines, then we're going to share a brief background on jail expansion in Orange County and the music facility, including statements from Mayor Farrah Khan and Vice Mayor Tammy Kim. Then we'll introduce our panelists and have a Q&A session. And in the last 30 minutes, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And if we could go to the next slide. Community guidelines. First, share your knowledge and screen, be active, engage, discuss at your own capacity and comfort level. 
use people-centered and people-first language, for example, people in immigration detention or incarcerated individuals. This is a safe space to talk about and question the carceral state. Anti-Blackness, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, racism, sexism, fatphobia, ableism, savior or charity ideology, and our classism will not be tolerated. Listen and ask clarifying questions. Take breaks if or when necessary. Share the space, step up and step back. Respect confidentiality. Share learnings, but do not attribute without permission. And if we could go to the next slide. We have a brief background on the music facility for folks who aren't familiar. The James A. Music Facility has sat empty for almost two years, but in May 2020, the Orange County Board of Supervisors quietly rushed through the approval of a $261 million contract to expand the music jail. Construction will cost $288 million with an annual operating cost of $61.5 million. In the midst of a pandemic and economic crisis, the Board of Supervisors left little room for public debate or education, despite decades of opposition against the jail. Music was Orange County's minimum security jail facility. It has also been referred to as the farm as a cover for putting people into cages. It is located in Irvine, adjacent to Lake Forest on unincorporated county land. The Orange County Sheriff's Department used to contract with ICE to hold immigration detainees in music, but was forced to stop the contract two years ago in the face of community pressure. Expanding the facility will mean adding about 900 new jail beds, bringing Orange County's total rated capacity to roughly 6,200. This comes at a time when our current jail population is at a historic low, around 3,200, the lowest it has been in more than a decade. Black, Indigenous, people of color are disproportionately targeted and incarcerated in Orange County. Black people make up 6.7% of the jail population, but only 1.6% of Orange County's population. Latinx people make up 46.5% of the jail population, but only 34.1% of Orange County's population. The top three charges that place people in Orange County jails are DUI, possession of drugs, and probation violations, which make up 40% of people in Orange County jails. More people are in jail for a substance use related charge or a technical violation than for every other charge combined. Although the Orange County Sheriff's Department first called the new music facility a mental health jail, the Orange County mental health community was not consulted on plans for the expanded jail. The OCSD has been involved in numerous misconduct issues that include deaths in custody, inadequate and untimely rendering of medical and mental health care, operating an illegal informant program, indiscriminately shackling people in custody, lack of effective external oversight, and failure to book evidence lawfully. During the pandemic, STM member Jose Armendariz reported that more than 2,300 people in OC jails were infected with the coronavirus. He wrote, if the county jail system were a city, at some point it would have been the city with the highest infection rate in Orange County. People cannot get well in a cell. Jails only make people worse. We believe the county government should invest in community resources that center care and divert people from crisis. This is the real answer to public safety. And next we have a statement that was submitted from Mayor Farrakhan. She wrote, I am aware of the expansion plans for the music jail and since my election to the Irvine City Council have continued to voice my concern and opposition to this expansion. The city of Irvine has filed seven separate legal challenges to the music jail since 1996 and three lawsuits regarding this expansion beginning in 2012. The county prevailed in all three suits, including through the appeal process. In April of 2021, I requested a presentation on the expansion's updates and subsequently initiated a resolution in May of 2021 against the expansion, to which I received a response from Sheriff Barnes stating that the expansion is legally settled and that our recent opposition to the expansion was disappointing. Sheriff Barnes also stated in his response that the impact to our surrounding communities is minimal. It is important for our community members to understand the impact this expansion will have on the city and our residents. Therefore, I urge all who are interested to contact the Board of Supervisors who have the authority to stop the expansion. Please know that I have done and will continue to do all I can in my capacity the decision to make change can and must come from Board of Supervisors. And we also have a statement from Vice Mayor Tammy Kim, which will be played.
Hi, everyone. I'm Vice Mayor Tammy Kim with the City of Irvine. Thank you for joining today's forum. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be here this evening. However, I did want to share a few words to kick off this forum. Earlier this year at the April 13th City Council meeting, the call to action was heard from the community to stop the expansion of the music jail. Concerns such as the over-incarceration of people of color, jail capacities and needs, disagreements over the prioritization of expenditures of public dollars, land use compatibility issues, and public environmental impacts associated with the expansion. This is why I introduced a resolution on May 11th calling on the Orange County Board of Supervisors to hold a public forum and to renounce the expansion of the music jail facility. The numbers have shown that incarceration rates have dropped off for a myriad of reasons, from past legislative and voter approved actions to health concerns as a result of COVID-19. Nevertheless, millions of dollars are still being invested into the music jail. And as I've said before, we cannot jail our way out of this public health crisis. So it's my hope that today's conversation will lead to tangible actions. Most importantly, that we capture the attention of our County Board of Supervisors and make them hear our voice of the community. Thank you so much for all the work that you do each and every day to push for social justice, especially in the areas of public safety reform and mental health. And I'd especially like to thank Stop the Music Coalition for all the work that they do and for this opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you very much and have a successful forum. And now we're going to introduce all of our panelists. Thank you again for taking the time to be here. And if anyone needs translation services, um, the translation button is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And first we have council member Larry Akron. Larry Akron first served on the Irvine City Council from 1978 to 1990, including six years as mayor. Under his leadership, Irvine received national recognition for its pioneering programs in childcare, affordable housing, recycling, and open space preservation. As a highly respected public interest attorney and public policy expert, Mr. Akron founded and in the 1990s led several nonprofit organizations the Local Elected Officials Project, the Center for Innovative Diplomacy, and City Vote. As the founder and volunteer chair of Project 99 from 1994 to 1999, Mr. Agron was especially active in working to defeat the county's plans to build El Toro International Airport in North Irvine. Instead, he successfully advocated creation of the Orange County Great Park at the former Marine Corps Air Base at El Toro. Mr. Akron returned to service on the Irvine City Council when he was elected to council on November 3rd, 1998. On November 7th, 2000, he was elected mayor of Irvine and on November 5th, 2002, he was reelected mayor. After completing two consecutive terms as mayor, Larry Akron was elected to a four-year term as an Irvine City Council member on November 2nd, 2004, and was reelected as a council member three more times serving until 2014. After six years off the city council, Larry Agron ran for and was elected to an open council seat on November 3rd, 2020, garnering more than 38,000 votes. And if we could go to the next slide. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, we also are joined by Dr. Ed Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is a retired professor of psychiatry at UCI, where he was director of psychiatric services and medical student residency training. He has been chief of psychiatric services at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary and director of prison mental health services for the NYC prison system. He has been a forensic expert on mental health care in prisons for the past 40 years including 25 years as an expert in the Coleman suit, which resulted in great changes in the California prison system. Presently, he works in community alternatives to incarceration and is the author of Tales of a Prison Psychiatrist. 
And next is Yehuda Price. Yehuda Price graduated summa cum laude from Adams State University, earning his Bachelor of Arts in Sociology with an emphasis in social welfare in 2019. He earned his Master of Social Work at the USC Suzanne Doric Peck School of Social Work in December 2020, where he was the chair of Unchained Scholars. And he is now working toward a Doctor of Social Work degree at Simmons University. He is a social worker for the Young Adult Court in Orange County, a psychotherapist at the Residential Addiction Treatment Center, Bet Teshuva, and a formerly incarcerated community member who was released in October of 2018 after serving over 16 years in prison for a nonviolent robbery that he was arrested for as a teenager. Yehuda is also a member of the Los Angeles DA Accountability Coalition, for which he published a report on criminalizing victims and trauma. And last but not least, we have Kathleen Ripley. Kathleen has a master's of planning and a BS in policy planning and management from the University of Southern California. Kathleen's passion for housing, civic participation, and public policy led her to increased engagement with local activist organizations where she met like-minded community members and helped to co-found grassroots organization, People's Budget OC in the summer of 2020. And now we can get into the Q&A portion. Um, if we could do a really quick speed round for all the panelists, why is it important to you to have this dialogue with Irvine and Orange County residents about the music expansion? And why does jail expansion and OC matter to you? Hi, this is Kathleen. I guess I can go first. And I think um, as a uh, almost lifelong Irvine resident and, um, and longtime Orange County resident, I think um, I, I was unaware about the expansion. And I think it's ex extremely important that there's, we gain public attention to this. Um, a lot of the agreements that were made were made without any public eyes on it. And that's just um, I think that that's wrong in our democracy, and we should all um, be aware of where our tax dollars are going, and um, especially large things that will affect affect our neighbors and you know a, a larger community. Hi, I'll be uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I mean. I believe it is important for the dialogue between Irvine and Orange County residents about the expansion. I, I mean, I'm an Irvine resident, uh, and I do know it's, it seems fundamentally undemocratic for the Board of Supervisors to essentially determine a policy that happened within uh, Irvine, and community members have no recourse or no say and no input, and then statements to be released simply saying that, oh, the impact will be minimal to community, but at the same time, they're not allowing the community uh, to be the judge of that particular statement. Uh, and I, I think it's important, especially in this historical times when we're coming for a racial reckoning, a societal reckoning to understand how particular policies affect uh, already historically marginalized populations. So it's important to me in that regard. Uh, and also uh, jail expansion in Orange County. When I was a teenager, Orange County was the uh, <laughs> where, where I was sentenced to actually 24 years in prison for a, a nonviolent robbery. And what that does to not just myself, but to my family and to the community, uh, uh, it, it further stigmatizes, further leads to all the uh, other disproportionate social service uh, utilization and impact. Uh, and it affects so many generations and it affects how other people view our particular uh, county as well. So I think it's very important to kind of uh, push back against what they're trying to do. Let me uh, say a word or two. I, uh, I think it's very, very important for people to recognize that public institutions, for better or for worse, reflect who we are as a people. And the fact of the matter is the James A. Music Jail Expansion Program is all about mass incarceration a model that was already outdated in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when this country and this state engaged in 
mass incarceration on a scale never really seen on the planet, let alone in this country. And now the question is, how are we going to use the dollars that are made available for this expansion? Are we going to do more in the way of mass incarceration, reflective of the worst of what public institutions are all about? Or why, might we take the roughly $300 million and $61 million a year in operational costs and quite literally build a thousand units, 1000 units of affordable housing that can be staffed and could have various levels of uh, correctional and custodial care that would actually engage in rehabilitating people and mainstreaming them back into society. These are the big questions that need to be answered. Who are we? What are we doing here? And obviously I will have more to say about how we absolutely need to uh, be heard by the Board of Supervisors in ways that uh, has, not, has not been the case to date. So uh, what really matters to me is the extent to which this jail expansion is going to be used to house uh, people who are uh, suffering from substance use disorders and suffering from mental illness. It's uh, totally, totally uh, the wrong method to handle this. And that's what uh, you know I'll be talking about at some length. But just briefly, it's atrocious to think that uh, one of the major purposes of this uh, new, new facility would be to treat mental illness and substance use disorders in a correctional setting. It's, it's just so uh, back in the Middle Ages. Thanks. And Larry, could you describe some of the history of music, including its history with ice? Well, I'm less familiar with its more recent history with ICE and more familiar with its uh, history as an honor farm, which incidentally was uh, a reasonably enlightened uh, method of incarceration uh, decades ago. And I actually had a chance to visit uh, music on a couple of occasions and saw some productive work being done there in terms of uh, custodial care, rehabilitation for nonviolent offenders. But uh, somewhere way back when, when I entered the picture in the 1990s, was this idea that no, the James A. Music Honor Farm needs to be transformed into a mass incarceration facility, more of a hardened jail or even prison than an honor farm. And the city of Irvine uh, undertook to challenge that project beginning in the mid 1990s and fought a long, hard legal battle over and over and over again, losing in effect to the county, to the state, to the uh, jail industrial complex that began to emerge. And so we are where we are now as a result of determined forces at the state, uh, in the county, and as it turns out at the federal level as well, that uh, wish to use ICE as a detention facility, uh, use the, the honor farm for ICE detainees and uh, uh, that's the more recent, the more recent history. So we see what was a reasonably decent honor farm model 
uh, transformed over the years into this mass incarceration model uh, and to actually emerge as a way, sad to say, for the county to make some money. <laughs> the idea is that these hundreds of millions of dollars are going to be spent. They're tremendous operational costs, but in effect, the county will be renting the facility uh, to the federal government, to other counties uh, for incarceration, and really get paid by the state as well for incarcerating people. It's a, it's a sad downhill journey that we have faced. In a sense, let me just conclude by saying the legal struggle is really over. Now it's a question of politically. Politically, can we muster the resources and prevail with a board of supervisors that so far has been entirely insensitive to the concerns of the more enlightened community here in Orange County. Uh, my, uh, my colleagues, uh, Mayor Kahn and Vice Mayor Kim, uh, in their statements, uh, made it clear that Irvine is eager to see a different course followed uh, on the uh, James A. Music campus. But this is going to require a Herculean political effort. Very, very difficult to mount, but it's imperative if we're going to have any breakthrough at all that we muster the resources politically to uh, really lean on the Board of Supervisors and others, our state legislators as well, if we're going to effectuate a different outcome. Thank you. And for Yehuda, could you speak to, about the specific impacts of incarceration on youth and families? Yes. Uh, so the impact of incarceration on the people, and I, and I like when we talk about person-centered language, I don't even say incarcerated individuals, I like to say incarcerated community members, because I think we have to speak about people incarcerated at a particular stage, you know, in their life, and they're incarcerated, but at the end of the day, they're going to come back to the community, right? These are community members. These are people that are going to be your neighbors. These are people going to be working jobs in your community. And I think if we don't view them as such, and we label them as offenders, I'm sure if you look at uh, many uh, websites or uh, communications by, you know, uh, any sort of correctional department, the sheriff's deputies, uh, you'll talk about inmates, uh, criminals, offenders. Uh, it loses that humanity and it dehumanizes uh, these particular community members. And it allows the public to think, oh yeah, perhaps public safety is better off with these particular community members incarcerated. And so they use the dehumanizing terms such as offender, criminal, parolees, and whatnot. So I want to I wanna, uh, throw that out there uh, to begin with. Now the incarceration experience, and I spent over three years in the county jail's uh, system prior to going to prison. It is a place of desperation, hopelessness. Uh, it, 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 it is a dark, dark place. And you're not looking for rehabilitation by sending people, incarcerating people there. You're looking, you're gonna make better criminals. There are a lot of, uh, racial division and it's it's played on by uh people in there where you are forced to be put in positions to do things that you would otherwise not do if you were incarcerated and that takes a toll on a person there, there's many studies as far as the trauma and i uh i think it was mentioned in my bio about a report i released and i know studies reveal like up to 60 to 90 percent of people who are incarcerated have encountered some sort of uh, lifetime traumatic event prior to that incarceration. So we're dealing with people who are uh, fundamentally affected by trauma in ways that are often you know, neglected, untreated, and then they're encountering a system where that trauma is only gonna be magnified and perpetuated to you know, a, a degree that's untold. And then we're asking them to go back into uh, the community, a community that labels them 
uh, offenders and inmates and parolees and expect that to have some sort of lasting effect. And so we're building these, these, these uh, building up people into people that are more likely gonna, gonna need social services and other sort of uh, 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 resources from the community that they could have they used on the front end as opposed to uh, on the back end when it's just magnified and there are more needs. And then there's families. I remember my mother undergoing so much, so much despair and depression over the fact that how can we get somebody that's incarcerated for the first time as an adult with no strikes or anything like that and sentence them to a quarter century in prison? Like what sort of system, what sort of system allows for that to happen, for that to be commonplace? And that it doesn't simply punish uh, the person incarcerated, uh, the youth, the wh whatever age group we're talking about, really, it's it's punishing their families as well. It's saying one, the person is unredeemable, and what does it say to the family, to to the brothers, to the sisters, to the children uh, that are affected by this when they're uprooted from the community and forced to be in this uh, criminal factories, so to speak. Of uh, what does it say? Where is their does it foster community? And when we're talking about it, and I'm sure we're gonna speak about, you know, the, the racial aspect of it, when, when, it's, when it's people of color being incarcerated at such, a, such a high rate, and it seems like when people are so invested in expanding jails, uh, knowing that it's gonna have a disproportionate effect on people uh, of color, it, 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 connects, it, it creates a disconnect or people disconnect from that community, from uh, law enforcement from uh, the public safety apparatus that sh they should be working for and towards. Uh, uh, and it creates this, uh, uh, this resentment towards a system that would, that would incarcerate so many people without first seeking you know, other particular avenues of, of rehabilitation of resources that are needed. Uh, and we also know that the studies reveal that even brain development, understanding consequences and understanding divisions uh, doesn't really occur until we're talking about between the ages of 25 and 27. So to, to, to focus on incarceration of a population who has not even uh, this is this basic science fully developed their, their capacity to make the best decisions, uh, it, it just it not only it just traumatizes those particular people and those families, uh, it sends a message uh, to the community uh, to, to other people across the nation of how we feel about uh, these people, especially uh, disproportionately being these people of color. Uh, and unless you're in these communities, I don't think you could truly understand the lasting impact that we'll have uh, in years to come. Yeah, and trying on your experience as a resident in Irvine and someone who works there, could you elaborate on how the music expansion would make matters worse? Well, for one, you're you're investing money to lock people up. It's a, a mental health jail, it's an oxymoron. If anybody has spent any time incarcerated, I have, so of course I'm speaking to it, it is not a place conducive uh, for somebody to increase their wellness, uh, their mental health wellness. It is a place that will only it it, it increases uh, the sort of uh, the sort of mental health challenges one might already face. And as I as I spoke about uh, previously, these people encountering the system have often already are dealing with mental health challenges. And I'm sure Dr. Kaufman could speak to this. Uh, and and not only that, just mental health challenges generally speaking, but specifically for for trauma. And so not only are they going to deal with that more, but there's a saying I believe it's. Uh, if you build it, they will come. So why are you building these? Why are you building these these jails up? Why are you expanding jails when we're at a historically low uh, 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 incarceration incarcerated population right now? Why are you expanding it? Obviously, they want to fill these beds. And what message does it send to those to these communities of color, to the community in general? Because I don't want to just isolate as if communities of color are not ex are not connected to, to 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 the broader population right we're all one particular community even though there are entities and agencies artificially creating this you know these divisions by incarcerating and focusing on particular populations uh, we can't buy into that so I'm not for 
let's build more jails and we'll figure out ways to keep it populated. And I know it's in vogue to say we're concerned about mental health concerns and whatnot. Uh, and so we'll, we'll kind of uh, tip our hat to that and say that's what we're doing. But we know that the situation inside of jails is not conducive to that. And not only that, were, the, were mental health professionals consulted? Is this the best way in to, to address our mental health needs? Uh, they weren't consulted. This was obviously people more concerned with building our capacity, uh, our capacity to incarcerate more people than concerned with how we could possibly use those funds to create these systems of wellness, systems conducive to creating positive change and, and, and showing that we care about our community and we don't feel like part of the community is the enemy and, and we should just incarcerate them more. So I feel like they're furthering the narrative that you have to incarcerate more people to create safety. And I don't, I don't believe that is in the best interest of those people being incarcerated, those families, those communities. And Irvine, I'm a resident of Irvine. Irvine is saying over and over, that's not what we want. But apparently uh, the Board of Supervisors and the powers that be believe that they know what's best for Irvine and they know what's best for these particular communities and they know what's best for these people being incarcerated. And I feel like expanding this and allowing them this to do so is just going to further entrench that uh, uh, the problem as it is. Thank you. And for Dr. Kaufman, would you be able to speak about the impact of incarceration on mental health? <clears throat> yes. Well, there are well, two aspects of it. One is the, the impact of an, an incarceration, which uh, just in and of itself tends to make mental health worse. As uh, Yehuda has said, uh, it, um, <clears throat> it, it generally uh, is, does not offer any kind of uh, help. In fact, it tends to make depression worse. It tends to make anxiety worse. Uh, it tends to make uh, psychosis worse. Um, so that incarceration is the antithesis of, of mental health. And then um, trying to give treatment in the jail, that's, that's a very um, interesting concept. Uh, because it's 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 almost an impossibility. Um, the, <clears throat> the there are so many barriers to uh, doing any kind of meaningful therapy with an inmate in jail. You know, you're, you're doing it through cell bars uh, with people in the cell on either side. You're doing it through uh, a heavy door with just a, a, a glass opening and and shouting to get through. Or you're doing it uh, with a, a, a bulletproof vest. Uh, these these are um, the antithesis of, of psychotherapy. And um, in, in some of the uh, institutions where I've been, in, in order to see a psychiatrist, first of all, uh, you get strip searched. Uh, then you get handcuffed. Then you get put in a cell with uh, you know, 10 or 20 other people. Um, and, and then there's a delay uh, for count, and then there's a delay uh, for meals, and then there's a delay because you don't have enough officers for transport. So, I mean, the average psychiatrist or mental health professional working in a jail uh, eight hours a day is, uh, is lucky if they get two hours of uh, <clears throat> working with inmates, and, and often that's not very um, meaningful. Um, so, in, in general, um, I'm, I'm very, very, very strongly against any attempt at delivering mental health treatment in a setting which is run by custodial authorities. It's, it's really impossible to do it. Uh, and uh, the, the idea of creating a mental health jail is, is just uh, bizarre. And uh, I think it will end up being much more expensive than it is. And I think that it will um, impact the mental health of inmates um, or individual or community individuals who are uh, currently incarcerated uh, in, in a very negative way. Uh, as Yehuda said, they've been traumatized. And when they're in jail, they're traumatized. Um, 
there's just so much that goes on in custodial settings in terms of uh, causing violence between individuals. Uh, I've also um, um, not spoken to anyone who, who said to me, you know, I couldn't get drugs in, in, in jail. Um, you know, <clears throat> there there's, seems to be quite a market for illicit drugs within jails. Um, and uh, it's got to come somehow or other with the knowledge of custody. Every, uh, every institution that I uh, evaluated had an officer whose job was mainly to attempt to keep drugs out. And uh, in general, they were not successful. So when I take a, a history of somebody and they tell me they've spent time in jail, and I'll, I'll always ask them, well, what drugs did you do? Or, or did you do, uh, did you drink uh, Pruno, uh, you know, the jail manufactured uh, alcohol? And invariably it's, yeah, we did. So uh, just to repeat, it's, uh, it's an anathema, it's an impossibility. And to put money into it is to put mental health treatment in Orange County uh, behind decades. Yeah, and on the topic of the money that is being put into the facility, I was wondering if Kathleen, could you touch on the amount of CARES Act funding that is going to the Orange County Sheriff's Department? Sure, yes, I can. Um, in terms of CARES Act funding, so the county received um, $554 million total in CARES Act funding. Um, the Sheriff's Department received the second largest allocation of that, those funds. They received $145.9 million or 26% of the county's total CARES Act funds, so just behind um, the healthcare agency, which received 167 million. And um, while the county hasn't been entirely transparent with the public on exactly how um, each department spent their CARES Act funds. We do know that from local reporters, um, public records requests, um, that the sheriff spent at least 93 million of those funds on their payroll. So um, that just for comparison, that's about 64% of all the money that that department received went to payroll. And then for comparison, the healthcare agency spent 35% of the money they received on their, you know, healthcare workers payroll. That's just a background of why, you know, why is the sheriff spending so much money on payroll when it's supposed to be for coronavirus um, recovery. Yeah. And could you also talk about the county budget and what jail expansion and staffing represents as part of that budget? Yeah, so the, uh, newly, um, the newly approved budget for this current year is about $7.7 .7 billion. Um, and uh, most of that money is what we call non-discretionary. Um, the county, which means that it's kind of earmarked through state fund, state you know, legislation that this money is going to this department or for this service. Whereas about um, one, just just under one billion of those dollars are discretionary funds, which is where the county has say over how they want to spend that money. So as part of the people's budget, that's generally what we focus on in our research and advocacy. Um, but specifically to the music facility, it's it's the county's estimated construction cost is estimated to be two hundred and eighty nine million dollars. Um, and as someone who works in the construction industry, I'll just say, I can say with confidence that final construction costs will be much higher. Uh, nationally, construction costs overrun, you know, typically between 15 and 25%. And publicly funded projects, you know, it's not unusual for those overruns to surpass 50%. So this is costing taxpayers, you know, it's going to cost taxpayers in construction, uh, you know, at least $300 million. That's probably an understatement. And then once the jail opens, the county has estimated that it, its operations are going to cost about $61.5 million annually. 
So that will add another you know, $61.5 million under our public protection section of our, of our budget, which currently takes up about almost 60% of all those discretionary funds. So those funds are going to Sheriff Corner and operating the jails instead of being spent in those community-based care or serviced housing or other programs that the community may want to benefit them. And for council member Agrin, again, um, how do you believe Irvine can best contest the expansion going forward? As I indicated earlier, it's time to flex uh, political muscle. The city of Irvine uh, is just one city, of course, but it's an important city in this particular fight and linking with other cities, I think can make a real difference. Now, the mayor and vice mayor and the entire city council adopted a resolution requesting that the board of supervisors hold a public hearing and otherwise open up the discussion about the music expansion. And uh, to my knowledge, that request has simply been ignored. And I think it's imperative, beginning with the mayor, the vice mayor, no doubt backed by other members of the council, but more important, backed by the community, the mayor and vice mayor, all of us must insist on some kind of meaningful dialogue uh, with the board of supervisors. We have a new supervisor or two on since uh, all these decisions were made. Uh, Katrina Foley, who no doubt would be open to alternative considerations for how these dollars, our dollars, should be appropriately invested in a reimagined kind of custodial care, uh, reimagined kind of rehabilitative system. And yet, none of that is going to happen without tremendous public pressure. So I think it's time uh, for Mayor Khan, for Vice Mayor Kim, for all of us to stop requesting and start insisting that the Board of Supervisors be responsive to the concerns that we're expressing. It's kind of difficult for me to convey just how much money we are talking about here. We mentioned millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, operational costs of $60 million uh, a year, $61 million a year. These are enormous sums of money that as I expressed before, would enable us to actually create a village of rehabilitation on the James A. Music Honor Farm site. That's a great piece of land, by the way. It's extremely valuable land. And we should be asking ourselves, to what uses are we putting this land? To what uses are we putting our dollars? And I can't, I can't for the life of me believe that if we actually engaged in a systematic discussion that included the Board of Supervisors and many, many others, that we couldn't reimagine custodial care, a rehabilitation system, particularly with respect to nonviolent criminals. Um, violent criminals um, are a special problem and we need all kinds of reform in those respects. But all of these nonviolent offenders who are serving extraordinarily excessive sentences, which as the other speakers have indicated, only tends to make them worse rather than better. I mean, if that didn't call for 
reimagination of the entire scheme of things. I don't know what does. And again, we're out of legal options. We're just pretty much out of legal options at this time. Now it's a question of political strength and whether we can muster community political strength in a way that can actually move the Board of Supervisors. And for all the panelists, what impact do you think a new jail will have on Orange County? What communities will be most impacted? And in what ways will this impact manifest itself in people's daily lives? Well, um, my, my concern is that, you know, all, all this money is going to a jail, perhaps uh, a jail for the mentally ill, um, or, or perhaps just another jail. Well, we'll have, we'll have to see about that. Uh, but the money could be spent on so many other things, so many other solutions that are necessary for the problem. As Larry said, it could be spent on housing. But there's there are so many places to intervene that um, a mental health jail is just a, a tip of the iceberg and yet all the money is going to this tip and the rest of the iceberg is just being totally neglected uh, so perhaps i'll talk about it later but there's a system called sequential intercept which um, deals with the problem at, at, at all levels uh, you know, it deals with it before people get into jail. It deals with it when they're in the courts. Uh, it, it, it does deal with it when they're in jail and, and provides adequate treatment. Uh, it deals with them as soon as they get out of jail. Uh, and it, and it, it deals with them in terms of jobs and housing when they leave. It deals with them with direct intervention in substance abuse problems and mental health problems. So all this money is going to a jail when it could be preventing people from getting to jail and preventing recidivism. And, and I'll build off, the, off of Dr. Kaufman's comments speaking about the recidivism. I think that's how it's gonna actually impact uh, uh, people's daily lives. When you are not treating the, the problem, you're not treating the issue and you're actually exasperating the issue people with the untreated trauma, with the, untre the untreated mental health challenges that they've been going through are released back into the community more broken than when they entered that particular facility to begin with. Now they're interacting back with the community in, in, a, in, a, in a less optimal state, a, a worse state, uh, as I mentioned, and that's gonna be an increase in recidivism. It's gonna be an increase in crime. That's gonna have a direct impact on people's daily lives. Uh, and if we're talking about communities that are going to be impacted mo most, we heard the statistics at the beginning uh, uh, of this uh, forum, and it's specifically stated and showed that communities of color are more directly impacted. And it says something that there is no consideration of that, right? There's no consideration of what communities are, are, are impacted most. And you tend to, when you have a commu communities that are, are, are more underserved, dealing with more more issues inside of them that you don't add to it, right? You, and if anything, you seek the community's uh, 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 input into what you think is most effective to alleviate the particular uh, uh, societal ills within that particular community, uh, but not just simply say, you know what, we're gonna expand in the jail and if we build it, people will come and most likely it will be uh, commun people from the communities of color. Uh, and, and, and so I think it's just going to add to not just not just the, the crime rate, I think it's going to add to uh, uh, people needing mental health services. I think there's going to just be more of a need if you're focusing on incarcerating and you're not using those funds to actually treat people prior to incarceration or instead of incarceration uh, or even after incarceration, right? We're using these funds specifically to incarcerate. And I, and I think uh, the impact is going to reverberate far into the future. Uh, in ways that we will know and in other ways that we may not know. Yeah, um, 
I can also speak to this as well. I had a family member who was incarcerated in the OC jails for a few months quite recently because of an issue related to her undiagnosed schizophrenia and her immediate family chose not to bail her out because they didn't know how to take care of her anymore and because they wanted her to get a diagnosis from the prison psychiatrist, but she ended up never getting one from them. And now she's unable to work or support herself because of her time there and had to move back in with other family members. And I think if we live in a community where people feel like incarceration is their only option for care, then we live in a place where the systems have failed or where the systems that we need are not in place at all. And um, that can take us to our next question. Um, what would a care-based approach to mental health and substance use in our community look like? And how can we push the county to spend the dollars slotted for music on those resources instead? And um, I'd love to hear from Dr. Ed Kaufman and Kat, if you're able to speak to this. Well, that, this um, leads to the uh, sequential intercept uh, system, um, which I've been alluding to. And it's basically uh, a six part intervention. And I know some of these interventions are being done, uh, but very often they're done inadequately. So the, the first would be uh, the community service, connecting people with treatment or services so that they're not arrested, so that they're not brought to the attention of, uh, of the police. Uh, using mobile crisis outreach teams, uh, training dispatchers so that they're not sending mental health problems to police, but they have to have community alternatives. Um, then once law enforcement gets involved, uh, their, their needs, they need to be taught how to divert to treatment and there needs to be treatment. Again, treatment that isn't in a mental health jail. Uh, then in the courts, there needs to be diversion um, when when people are in the courts so that they're, they're not sent to jails. Uh, when they get to jails, there needs to be diversion. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> when they're in the jail, there needs to be there needs to be decent treatment and it, and it needs to be in, in, in decent settings and it needs to be uh, uh, evidence-based. There's a lot of evidence-based uh, success in, uh, in treatment in the penal system. It, it's, uh, it's often uh, piecemeal. Uh, in fact, all of this is piecemeal. There, there just isn't integration to bring around this comprehensive sequential uh, program that I'm talking about. And then we go to uh, what happens when they, they leave the jail? Well, you know, a mentally ill person or a homeless person has to be picked up and they have to be taken to a reasonable place to live. They have to be taken to a place where they can get treatment. They can't be given a slip of paper. They can't be let out at uh, one minute after midnight uh, to, to wander around. Um, and then uh, probation and parole. On, you know, they're grossly understaffed and there needs to be specialized uh, community supervised caseloads. Uh, and, and they need to have access once again to housing, uh, vocational training and, and employment. So the, the answer is uh, this kind of comprehensive program where, where all of these uh, aspects, each, each one needs to be strengthened and develop and coordinate it. And, you know, again, just emphasizing what is in, in some ways the weakest link and pouring money into it is just going to make it weak, weaker um, is antithetical to spending money in a way that's meaningful and that truly helps the mentally ill and um, the people with substance use disorders. and. Uh, also, I, I agree with you in terms of uh, how traumatized all of these people have been. And then, believe me, the trauma is greatly accelerated when they are incarcerated. So we have traumatized people entering a system which is supposed to help them 
but which traumatizes them further. So the dollars have to be distributed in this way, but, but they have to be integrated. Uh, they just can't be thrown out. I know some of these programs um, have been tried. Uh, there've been a lot of successful programs in, in, in jails uh, using therapeutic communities, uh, using uh, uh, communities with meditation uh, and, and often these programs work and then they get defunded. So once again, there's no, there's no coordination of all of the different ways that, that these people can be helped. That's all. I think everything that Dr. Kaufman said is so important and so true. There are, there are a lot of amazing case studies that have worked across the country and some locally as well. And then as far as this, how can we push the county? I, um, I'll give you an example of something our group um, and our coalition has just worked on this week is um, it's, a, it's a lot of advocacy at the County Board of Supervisors. We look at the um, different agenda items and when it comes to like an example of something that comes to spending on something that would keep us safe versus not even not keep the community safe, we just commented on the inmate welfare fund. The county was going to approve the sheriff's, um, you know, expenditures for it. And they spent 77% of the inmate welfare fund on sheriff's salaries. And they spent just 0.04% on inmate reentry. 0.04% of the inmate welfare funds. That's welfare, the funds that come from family members that the prices they pay for those expensive phone calls and the commissary. And it's supposed to be directed towards inmate welfare. So an example of what we can do is just keep calling out the abuse of all of these funds and these tax, do tax dollars to the point where the supervisors will not be able to turn the other cheek anymore. And what do you all see as the biggest connections between the crisis system and incarceration? Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that. I, I've kind of mentioned it uh, all throughout my answers. Uh, I'd like to say that a lot of problems you see uh, communities of color deal with are problems left over from the legacy of the history of uh, our country, county, cities. Uh, and even if you take away from specific race-based policies uh, that are discriminatory, saying, uh, trying to apply some law of neutrality, like, oh, you know what? These are laws that they apply to everybody equally, and those historical uh, injustices have never really been rectified or addressed. They tend to perpetuate those inequalities. So if we're not looking at if we're not looking at how something disproportionately impacts a particular uh, racial group, and if we simply say it doesn't matter, the law is neutral, I think what we're doing is we're perpetuating racism, we're perpetuating these racial uh, uh, inequities. And, and so it makes sense to at least uh, consult communities of color, communities in general, obviously they're not into doing that, but if the people are disproportionately uh, being incarcerated are people uh, of color, uh, and that needs to be looked at. To, to simply deny that that is something to be considered is to deny the humanity of, uh, of people of color, to deny that people of color are equal members of the community. When any particular demographic in a community is facing, whether it's a crime problem, whether it's a, a op opioid uh, uh, problem, whether it's a, a property tax problem, whatever it is, the problem is, uh, officials should take into account what that particular uh, 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 population is going through when they create laws or create policies or decide to expand jails. If you, if you are expanding jails and incarcerating people uh, of color at a higher rate than anybody else, that bears, you know, some sort of, something needs to be addressed in that. And if it's not, you're just perpetuating uh, these racial inequalities and it's going to continue on in perpetuity. And not only that, it creates distrust amongst uh, this particular population. Uh, it creates uh, resentment. It creates uh, it, it creates less community. It creates less connection to one's community, 
and it makes people feel isolated and it actually adds to trauma, whether it's intergenerational and happening right now. Uh, and this will continue on uh, going forward unless it's actually addressed. You can't simply say, I understand that uh, people of color are facing uh, a disproportionate incarceration rate, and yet I'm not going to consider that. I'm just going to keep on building uh, jails. Uh, and I think we're just uh, further, uh, further further adding to the race racism in, uh, in our country, in our communities, and this will continue unless people just stand up and say, you know what, enough is enough. Uh, let's be concerned about that, whether we are people of color or we're not, we're all part of the community, and this matters to us. And as was stated before by the councilman, that you know these, these public institutions are supposed to reflect who we are as a people. And if we are as a, if we're saying that the public institutions that we're creating are are not considerate of, of people of color, it's not a priority, it's not even a concern, it's not even a consideration, then what is that saying about us as a people? And could you all also talk about what is crimigration and how do you think these connections will be reproduced in the music jail expansion? I'll, I'll hop in with a with a, a brief uh, brief answer uh, to that. I mean, so if we are if we are using if we are trying to criminalize people who are uh, undocumented or whatnot, and we are trying to aid and abet the federal government in that regards, and we're, are we renting out uh, these beds? Right, we're we're building it and hoping to fill to incarcerate people, and, and not only that, we're hoping to incarcerate people who are undocumented and. When you're saying people, community members, I, I should use my own terms, I'm telling you, undocumented community members, uh, these people are connected to the community. They have family, they have children, they have cousins, they have uncles, they have, they, they're, they're, they're part of the community. And when you, when you seek policies that are going to further criminalize them or create incentive, incentivize the criminalization and incarceration of this particular uh, population, uh, that creates an, another uh, break with the community. Because people are saying, like, why are you why are you so concerned with incarcerating my family members? You know, people are going to work, people are providing for their, their family. Why are you so concerned? Not only that, when crime happens within these communities, people who are undocumented are going to be less likely to, to cooperate with law enforcement, knowing that this distrust is created, knowing that they may face some sort of uh, repercussions on the legal side. Uh, and so I know I, I know it really it really creates this distrust and, and ruins a lot of families' lives and a lot of communities' lives. Uh, and we can't just think about undocumented community members in isolation. We got to all, whenever we're talking about in, uh, community members, whether they're incarcerated or free, we got to think about what that means to be a community member. You're connected to other people of the community uh, uh, regardless. And that needs to be considered when we're talking about what, we're, what, what sort of message are we sending to the community of what we represent? Uh, are we saying, you know what, we're representing, uh, uh, we feel it should be expanded. We should be participating in the criminalization of undocumented people because that's what we stand for. Uh, uh, I think that it's, it's, it's very disheartening to say the least that that is what's being done and that's the message that we're sending to our community. Oh, sorry, Kat, I think you're on mute. Got it, thank you. I double muted myself just to be safe. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I will add to this, that um, the members of, and a lot of members of our coalition are very concerned about this, is that you know the music jail facility um, was cleared out and emptied. And our current um, populate, jail population in Orange County is, around, I think, around 3,000 people. And if they build all the are successful in building all these beds, the capacity of our jails will only be at 45%. Well, we don't really think that they're going to build all these beds to leave the jails at 45%. In the past, they rented beds in the music facility to ICE. So if you add up the 
you know, equations and the missing pieces, it becomes very clear that it, the sheriff will probably be transferring prisoners from other other facilities in Orange County and then be able to rent out beds elsewhere in the county to ICE. And what alternatives to incarceration or to jail expansion do you all envision for Orange County or for California as opposed to the music jail? Well, I, I think I've really spelled it out. I, I think there has to be uh, a, a global integrated program to deal with the issues of criminalization of the mentally ill and substance use uh, disordered individuals. And uh, I think that's, that's the way, that's the evidence-based way. And pouring all this money into uh, bricks and mortar makes people feel good because they see what their money's getting spent on. Uh, but it's just antithetical to what's needed at this time in our society. Uh, yeah, I'd like to, you know, I'll plug my own program that I'm involved with right now. So I'm a clinical social worker with the Young Adult Court program in Orange County. I think it's an innovative program. Uh, it's only of one of, of eight such programs in the country, I believe, uh, last, last time I uh, checked. And as, essentially what we do for transitional age youth, essentially uh, youth between the ages of 18 and 25, based on the research of the brain development of uh, uh, Dr. Kaufman at UCI, uh, Beth Kaufman, that is, uh, 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 is that instead of, I'll, I'll go inside the jails uh, you know, if they if, if they're incarcerated or maybe if they're, they're released, and I'll see if they're suitable, if they're deemed suitable for this program, they'll get released into the program. Uh, I will support with clinical interventions, whether they need support with transportation, housing, job development. Uh, uh, we give them the so full support of services they need. I'll contact their family members. Maybe I'm working with their family members. Uh, we're, 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 we're connecting them to whether they need a, maybe they need to see a psychiatrist. Maybe they don't have insurance. And a lot, a lot of these youth don't have the life skills necessary to be uh, 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 productive, you know, productive citizens as everybody wants for public safety. You can't simply say incarcerate and then release and feel like that's going to solve the problem when a lot of people were incarcerated because they, their, their family environment, the systems they've been involved with, the trauma they've been involved with never has never been treated and they don't have necessarily the life skills to navigate successively. And so we provide that. And, and if they successfully complete the program, uh, the program is uh, 18 months minimum. Uh, and it could last, it could last three years, depending on what it is, uh, they will have their criminal record, uh, uh, their felony will be reduced to a misdemeanor and possibly dismissed. And when we're talking about recidivism rates and, and navigating um, navigating these systems and, and, and life as a free person, collateral consequences is something to keep in mind. That jail record stigmatizes and it, it leads to a barrier that is super hard to overcome. I know this from my own experience of being released uh, uh, from prison and trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm, I was I was washing dishes, thinking to myself, like, hey, there got to be more I could do, you know, uh, uh, and just with that jail record, explaining yourself to people like this is what happened when I was a teenager. Uh, this is the situation. Uh, and, and so we're, I'm part of this program right now, the Young Adult Court, that is six, that is actually implementing this as we speak. I'm hoping that we can have more people. Right now we have 30 something people. I feel like there, be, there should be an expansion of people eligible. Uh, there, there's talk, so when we speak, speak about nonviolent, uh, uh, you have something to say, uh, Dr. Kaufman? Well, yeah, I mean, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly the problem. You only have 30 some people involved in your program. It works, it's a beautiful program. We need more programs like this. We need more specialized programs with people who are well-trained and who are using evidence-based uh, treatment methods and uh, are following people from the time they enter until they, they leave to see that they're adequately taken care of throughout the whole time they're in there. This has to be expanded. There are lots of programs like this, 30 people doing this, 30 people doing that, but, you know, and, and, and often they get defunded. 
because people want to build buildings, prisons. We need more like you. Let me uh, just say a word or two. I completely agree with what's just been said. What needs to be emphasized over and over again is that the resources are there now. I mean, this whole expansion program is so remarkably expensive. And what needs to be done is putting in front of the Board of Supervisors and all people who live in Orange County, an alternative model, which is, wait a second, we can either build or rebuild the music facility into a, a hardened, expensive facility costing hundreds of millions of dollars and which entails operational costs of $100,000 a year per incarcerated individual. And we can say, wait a second, shouldn't we instead provide for decent appropriate housing and social support in the amount of $100,000 a year in the context of that kind of a community instead of a hardened prison or jail facility. It just has to be put in front of people as a choice. You can't beat a bad idea. I've learned this over many, many years. You can't beat a bad idea, which the current jail expansion program is, with no idea. You have to have a specific alternative that allows people to reimagine what we could do with those resources. You know, it kind of surprised anybody uh, participating in this program tonight. Other countries seem to do a better job. Uh, certainly uh, the Germans do a better job, the Scandinavians, uh, so many other countries do a much, much better job than we do. Why can't we do that in Orange County? We actually have the opportunity, we have the resources, but we've got to muster the political strength to overcome the current paradigm with an alternative. Is there a project or program that you all would rather have the county spend time and money on rather than the music expansion? Uh, I'll just add for an expansion of this program, uh, uh, as Dr. Kaufman mentioned. Uh, and, and, and when we're talking about expanding, I also believe we have to take a real hard look at, there's all, often the play of, of, of oh, nonviolent you know, offenders or violent offenders. But one, we should all understand that if we were about 16% of the you know, United States uh, 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 incarcerated population is for nonviolent uh, offenses. If you released everybody, we'd still have mass incarceration. So it's actually how we choose to define what violent crime is. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, when I say nonviolent robbery, some a law enforcement uh, agent may say, no, that's an oxymoron, right? All robberies are violent. And I, and I understand that I did to a certain extent, but if nobody is physically harmed or physically touched, do we put that person in the boat of violent, of violent crimes and therefore say there's no redemption for them? There's no possible avenue back uh, to society in, in a reasonable amount of time? Uh, uh, and, and, and I think that matters because it's disqualifying people for so many programs because they're violent offenders uh, and, 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 and that matters. And so I feel like I'm not saying just release everybody from jail, but I'm saying if we have all these social services in place, if we have all these interventions in place that help people along the way prior to entry, while incarcerated, after they're incarcerated, uh, uh, and, and we start stop saying, well, this person is a violent offender, this person's a nonviolent offender, uh, uh, because that kind of fuels, I don't know if people are familiar with the, the, uh, the William Horton effect, right? Because if you can just latch on to somebody as being violent, 
uh, or this is the cause, then you could drum up support for, for you know, strong in incarceration first, uh, tough law and order policies. And I, I, I think we, we got to expand uh, the pool of potential people that can, uh, that can have these services. And you got to remember, even if a person is convicted of a violent offense, that person, the vast majority of the time is returning to the community. So again, this is not about simply release everybody from jail tomorrow. This is about how do we want the people we've already deemed as violent offenders, how, how do we want them integrated in the community? Do we still put this sort of, uh, you're not a community member, you're this violent offender? Are we actually offering these particular programs uh, uh, to them? And I think these programs can start a lot sooner uh, than people believe. And I think the young adult court can expand uh, and maybe obviously we're not we're, we're not saying oh young adult court anybody who committed a murder you're in here and now you you can get your record life clean we're not saying that but we're saying that we have to expand the talk of people who are eligible to be part of this program and as Dr. Coffin mentioned it can't be simply oh 30 people here 30 people there and we could pat ourselves on the back like oh we're doing so much for rehabilitation and prison reform and we care uh, when actually perhaps uh, uh, we should be expanding this and building upon this particular momentum and not just affecting these people's lives because these people's lives, though they are community members, are connected to so much more of the community that they're going to have to interact with. Uh, uh, and so I just think an expansion of that needs to occur. We also have some questions from the audience. One person asked, knowing how overstretched our social services network is, how do we get our state to develop a plan for increasing the number of support service, social workers, psychologists, counselors, et cetera, graduates so that we have the personnel resources to truly create a system of restorative justice for those in crisis? Let, let me maybe uh, add a little background information here. The fact of the matter is the way we do this is the way you do it in your own lives. You take resources that you have available and you might examine when you're short of resources well, where am I spending money that's not particularly productive as opposed to where might I spend it where it would be more productive? But the fact of the matter is right here, right now, at this moment, we have unprecedented amounts of money in the state of California, in the county of Orange, the United States itself is spending, the United States government spending tremendous sums of money. The, the fact is there's a roughly a 75 to a hundred billion dollar surplus in Sacramento. Cities have surpluses. The county is just through the first round of federal spending. Uh, the county of Orange was sent $700 million that they had never seen before. Um, the amount of money that's out there now to make these kinds of transformative changes uh, is just almost beyond imagination. So now is the moment to have people rethink how we are using our resources. If they go ahead with the music expansion uh, on the track that it is now, uh, that, that money will be wasted forever. If on the other hand, we can stop that and insist that those resources be spent in other more productive ways and add to that all the support, the social support services funds that are coming to the state and to localities, uh, the future can be very, very different. That's why this forum this subject at this moment is so important 
And that's why I just keep coming back to it over and over again. You have to seize the political moment in order to make transformative change. And for council member Agrin, again, we have another question. You mentioned that maybe it is time for the mayor or vice mayor of Irvine to demand a response from the board of supervisors. What mechanisms are available to the Irvine city council to effectuate a demand like that? In other words, what are specific ways that the city of Irvine can exert power against the board of supervisors? And what other cities do you recommend we pursue to join the fight? Well, first of all, speak up publicly. Uh, we have politely requested by way of a resolution that there be a board of supervisors hearing on the matter. Maybe it's time to stop being so polite about it and just acknowledge to the public that our supervisor, Don Wagner, in the case of the city of Irvine, has been totally unresponsive. We haven't heard from him. We haven't heard from the Board of Supervisors, and we ought to request that he come to a city council meeting and speak to us about why this gross misallocation of resources is going forward, even when the public doesn't support it. Also, tell the story to the press. Get the word out there that we have a Board of Supervisors that is totally unresponsive. Go to board meetings. The mayor and vice mayor, uh, other council members as well, could go to board meetings in an organized fashion and say, what do we have to do to get a public hearing on this matter? A genuine forum where we can discuss and reconsider this matter. Uh, we need to get ordinary citizens involved in pressuring the board as well. And I know what a terrible, unresponsive board of supervisors we have. I understand that. But it's time that people muscle up a little bit politically and point that out to the rest of the public. Uh, there's always, too, the question when you have a totally unresponsive public official, as we do with most of our supervisors, uh, you have to be prepared to mount a candidacy to oust that person from office. I mean, now's the time to get tough here, to get tough in a violent, effective way to leverage what political power we do have to force those in higher positions of authority to uh, listen to us, to begin to change their attitudes and begin to change the priorities of this county. I'd be happy to give tutorials to people on this kind of thing. I've been doing it. Most of the people, no doubt, who are uh, participating in the forum tonight are political activists. And now is the time for creative political action in order to change the paradigm that's out there. I have one question from someone that maybe Pat could answer. Can you please speak more about music's relationship with profit and the process of housing incarcerated folks from other states? My understanding was that the incarcerated population in Orange County has significantly decreased. And I'm wondering how this is justified when there is a decrease in demand. I'm sorry, was that a question about uh... Uh, you broke up just a little bit. Was that a question about uh, the, the profit profit factor in all of this? Yeah, it was, I can repeat it. Can you please speak more about music's relationship with profit and the process of housing incarcerated folks from other states? My understanding was that the incarcerated population in Orange County has significantly decreased. And I'm wondering how this is justified when there is a decrease in demand. Well, of course, there isn't enough internal demand in Orange County to justify this at all. The numbers you gave are very telling. 3,200 uh, incarcerated. I Just a few years ago, there were, I don't know, four, 
four or five thousand. Uh, it has been going down uh, in recent years. And so what do we have? We have all this excess capacity and it's being built with the understanding that, all right, we'll rent jails out. Jail cells will be rented out to uh, other counties that don't have the capacity that we do. Uh, jail cells will be rented out to the federal government for uh, jailing detainees. Uh, and you begin to see here what's going on is uh, all that capital stock, all these facilities are intended for revenue generating purposes that uh, no doubt as the revenue comes in, it goes to underwrite more of the same and underwrite the sheriff's department. So the whole thing is really sick, really sick. And in some cases, of course, uh, uh, we're, we're familiar with uh, facilities being built by the state or the locality and then run, actually run by private for-profit entities. And on top of that, when you think about what it takes to run a jail, there are so many industries that are supplying goods and services uh, to these, uh, to these uh, facilities that on the one hand, you know, we have something we call the military industrial complex. I think all of us know what that's about. But here we have the jail industrial complex where the private sector is profiting enormously from these huge public investments. And then you have, as I mentioned, you have uh, the sheriff's department and others, uh, the county looking for ways to make money, to generate revenue, to support all kinds of county services and keep taxes low. That's what politicians like to do. We wanna keep taxes low. So we'll build these mega facilities, we'll rent them out, we'll generate revenues that way. The whole thing is so sick, so, so twisted in its motivations and incentives, it has to be completely rethought from top to bottom. Some of that was going on in Sacramento, but none of it has been going on here in Orange County. We need to spark that debate. That was the last question we had. Um, if there was anything else that the panelists wanted to add before we conclude. Yeah, I think there's one thing that I would like to add that um, I find so many aspects of this, you know, pretty scary, but one of the ones that just it's is so glaring to me having looked at um, you know, the budget and the way the county has decided to spend our, our discretionary funds over the past year or so pretty in detail is every year, every quarter, every budget meeting, the sheriff is going to ask for more money and they're gonna spend that money on salaries and benefits. And um, I mean, it's almost 200%, the amount of discretionary funding has in, increased almost 200% in the past 10 years all to the sheriff, but it's so the building of this jail is another excuse for them to grab money from all of us, all of our neighbors to put in their pockets and not benefit the community, to not make us safer. And I find it extremely important that we all take a stand against this because we can look at their history and that <laughs> there's no way that they're not gonna use this as another reason to steal all of our public funds for their department versus all of the other great things that people would like to see built 
and services they would like to see in their community that they believe would really keep them safe. Yeah, and I just want to add add to that is is the public has to continue just to put the pressure on these people involved. So if you're going to those board of supervisor meetings, uh, uh, do what you need to do. If you need to write write into op eds, write make a, a significant change in the public perception of what's going on. Uh, that's what needs to be done, and the pressure can never can never cease. This is an ongoing battle. I imagine there's going to be a, a, a request for more funds and more expansion at some other time because that's just the nature of what we're working with. And we we got to take a stand, and we can't stop uh, what we're doing. And, and forums like this uh, uh, are necessary, but it's not going to be enough to stop the tide of what we're facing and just continue and keep up with the pressure. I'll just uh, underscore uh, what I've said before, which is, uh, and my my uh, colleagues on the panel have been uh, alluding to, we absolutely must apply political pressure and do it in systematic ways and be willing to be a little bit obnoxious about the whole thing and point to other models. There are other communities that have done this better, dealt with this in a better way. And if you have to import, uh, whether it's from Canada or from uh, Germany, uh, Scandinavian countries, um, if you have to import models that work better here, we've alluded to the kinds of models that would be a better investment of funds. Uh, then do it. Uh, don't just condemn the existing misallocation of funds. That's incredibly important. We have to point to ways that reallocating those funds in more productive ways would make a true, true difference. Uh, I, uh, I don't think it's just a question either of going to Board of Supervisors meetings. I think it's a question of uh, meeting with individual supervisors in their offices. If they won't meet with you in their offices, then stand out in front of their houses and insist on meeting with them there. Uh, this is a time to uh, get active in a way that will, with nonviolent pressure, make a real difference. I can't emphasize that enough. Without it, we're just talking to ourselves. Thank you. I just want to emphasize what a, a unanimity of uh, voice and thought and ideas there has been on the panel. I don't think too many of us knew each other before, and uh, I think we're all on the same pathway, and uh, I think we can all work together to stop this foolish, uh, ridiculous, antediluvian expenditure of money and instead have comprehensive programs across the board. But like I say, people like to see buildings. They like to see bricks and mortar. But we, we I mean, this is the evidence-based programs are new and we've got lots of them and they work, but they don't work if there are only 30 people and they don't work if like, for instance, you know, Phoenix House had a program in the Orange County jail system and it worked and it got removed because they, that jail made more money from ICE. And so there has to be constant pressure uh, on the system that uh, only only we can do. And uh, I think it has to be political. I also, nobody has mentioned the ACLU and I know I think they have some role in the, this panel today. And uh, you know, I, I know like to make change in the, in the California prison system, I was involved in the common suit, common suit for 25 years and we had to keep suing and suing and suing and we would win and we had to sue again and they had to put in monitors this is a system that's very resistant to change and i think the only answer is community involvement and community-based treatment amazing okay so i think that's all the questions we have left um thank you to all the panelists for your time and care and being here um, and to everyone in the chat for their engagement and their thoughtful questions, it's appreciated. 
And if you would like to say that you just got the music or the organizing, got the facility, um, we have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and we also have a website, stopthemusic.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter to learn about any upcoming events or actions we do if you want to get involved. You can also send a letter to the Board of Supervisors there if you want to stop the music expansion. And you can also get in contact with us there if you would like to strategize and discuss future US meetings if someone mentioned any questions. And we also have a petition right now between one of our inside members home and Jose and the parties. You can access and scan it. You can access and sign it by scanning the QR code or going to our link tree also find some of the articles that he's written about the Orange County jail system. And I'll just leave all this info up for folks to peruse. And thanks again, everyone, for coming, especially our panelists and coalition partners, and also members of Boston and Paul and everyone. And